Now we're going to move from Europe back to the United States and talk about revolution going on in the U.S. Uh, the revolution going on in the U.S. had to do with the Harlem Renaissance um, with African Americans. So the Harlem Renaissance were led by a man named Alan Locke. Um, he wrote a book called The New Negro, and it called for a greater social and political activism among African Americans. Um, Harlem, because of New York City's large growth, becomes uh, wealthier. Um, and so the wealthy middle class settled into Harlem. Uh, it was an African American community and Locke pulled all of them together. He pulled together um, brilliant philosophers and writers like Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, artists like Jacob Lawrence, uh, philosophers like Richmond Barth and William Grant Still, Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, Ralph Bl Bunch, and John Dewey. Aaron Douglas was an artist of the Harlem Renaissance. He studied art in Nebraska uh, before he went to Paris and finally setting in, settling into New York City. He becomes part of the flourishing art scene in the 20s and 30s uh, and part of the Harlem Renaissance. He was encouraged by Locke and Dubois and others uh, attached to the Harlem Renaissance to explore African art as part of his cultural inheritance. Here, Douglas develops his style of African-inspired art. From what was a very powerful cultural movement that encompasses all fields of art and advocated celebration of African cultural identity and heritage, Douglas was influenced by Cubism and African sculpture and was greatly influenced by folk art themes. He wanted to bring cultural identity to the forefront of his art. He did a series of seven paintings based on a book of poems by James Weldon Johnson uh, called God's Trombones, Seven Negro Sermons in Verse. Douglas successfully breathed cultural life into work inspired by Cubism and African sculptural motif. Uh, Noah's Ark is what you're looking at right now. It's characterized by the formal analytical innovations of Cubism. Uh, there's a narrow range of hues, just like in Cubism, but here he uses blues and purples, as well as a narrow range of geometric shapes and a geometric definition of space. There's a sense of transparency in the overlapping geometric forms that define perspectives. So as you look at the work of art, you can see that the triangular plane that starts in the upper right hand corner uh, fades down into the left. You can see the different planes of the large ship as well as the um, animals that are part of the story walking into the ship. But you get a sense of three-dimensionality based on the way he shades or uses color in planar, in simple planar shapes. In 1934, for the 135th Street branch of the New York Public Library, which is now the site of the Schomburg Center, Mo the most inspirational part of the series was displayed uh, called The Song of Towers, done in 1934. It was about eight, eight feet square and it showed a man raising his arms, a saxophone in one hand, as though to praise the Statue of Liberty, which you can see far off into the distance in the center of the canvas, where the mountain range is split open and the yellow meets the mountain range. There's a sense of visible distance that soars uh, coming through the 
Canyon of the Mountains. And you know what? I'm sorry. I called them mountains because to me they looked like mountains, but as I dis as I study them more and look at my notes, they're actually skyscrapers. Uh, and so there's something to be said about that. The skyscrapers are so large and so monumental that they seem uh, mountainous. And Douglas intended that. He's trying to get a sense of visual distance, but he's also trying to give you a sense of the culture in which African Americans face at this given point in time in society. African Americans are struggling due to the Jim Crow laws, due to, due to um, segregation and uh, prejudice and their ideas and their accomplishments are being overshadowed by white men. And so the opportunity to uh, sort of climb the ladder of success becomes a challenge. And so you get this figure who is praising uh, with music. He's got his hand raised with his saxophone. Music was a very important part of the Harlem Renaissance. It capitalized on uh, jazz musicians like Louis Armstrong, who made great strides in uh, music for African Americans, but for all people in terms of jazz. Uh, the skyscrapers are tilted, and there's a sense of hopeful aspiration as he raises his hands up towards the sky. Um, even though he stands at the top of the cogwheel that looks like a large gear and is praising towards the sky, you see a man behind him who's desperately trying to climb up the cogwheel. In front of him are Industrial Revolution smog, um, things that are spewing fumes into the atmosphere, um, talking about machinery and remembering that New York is a city that has a lot of this type of industrialization. Symbolizing that the gears may grind up the accomplishments that have been achieved. This is another one of Aaron Douglas's work. Um, it is, again, a work of art that is done at the end of his career and sort of unnotable landscapes that he's done. Uh, he seemed to have a better opportunity doing the images that were celebrating accomplishments. Um, he taught at a university after having some great success during the Harlem Renaissance time with painting. Uh, and he led negotiations with the Works Progress Administration to secure federal contracts for African-American artists. So he makes a big wave in the world of art, securing uh, equal space or securing space for African-American artists so that they have a bigger voice in the conversation uh, about art and technology at the time. This is James Van Der Zee, and James Van Der Zee decided that he was going to make his mark on the Harlem Renaissance world or on society through the Harlem Renaissance world uh, by taking pictures of African Americans in an elite setting. So you have this uh, man who's driving a Rolls Royce, his uh, female friend is standing beside him in a beautiful fur coat uh, with um, material riches at their sides. Van der See settles in New York City and is originally from Massachusetts. 
and establishes a photo studio in Harlem. Uh, the studio brings him immediate commercial success as a portrait photographer. And over the next two decades, he photographs numerous members of the Harlem community. Um, Van der See portrays his subjects as they choose to be represented and remembered through photography. He approaches portraiture more as an art form than straightforward visual record, often introducing theatrical aspects and having his subjects pose with elaborate props and backgrounds reminiscent of the 19th century photographs. Um, with such accoutrements as these long fur length, or the long length fur coats, uh, lots of jewelry, diamonds, um, things that are subs associated with fashion forward trends and um, wealth and substance. Amanda Z was the official photographer for political activist and orator Marcus Garvey. He captured numerous Universal Negro Improvement Association members posing in their military-like garb. Um, Garvey was not a, in the military. He simply is wearing a military uniform because he is a fighting a battle um, for African Americans. Uh, you see his wife sitting in the chair next to him and his young son who stands uh, in a military uniform also. As a family, they fight for space um, for the African-American voice in society um, as a way of saying African-Americans have something monumental to contribute to society, that um, they are philosophers, they are artists, they're creative, uh, and it speaks truth to the Af African-American contribution uh, in society. He often took portraits that he then retouched or used a double exposure to add elements of um, texture in the work. For example, he would take a double exposure to create um, a smoky feel or an imaginative feel, uh, which you see here. This young woman's dressed in beautiful rich dress with a fur lined collar and the background behind her seems hazy or foggy or smoggy. Um, it's because of the double exposure. He creates this sort of signature of the double exposure behind uh, the young lady. Not only he does he uh, create some unique perspectives in portraiture, like the one we just saw with a hazy background. Um, he photographs the famous people. Uh, his f career ends up taking a bit of a stall after the 1930s because camera equipment gets more expensive and the, con the economy takes a nosedive. Uh, but in 1969, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York features a selection of his works um, and it was called, it was in a multimedia exhibition called Harlem on my mind. The show took a lot of criticism due to the lack of African American art of the more refined and artistic forms, such as painting and sculpture. But his work was displayed and he saw a resurgence even through the negative publicity, uh, he sees a growth in, in demand for his photography. And so famous people come to him asking to be photographed, like Bill Cosby, uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat, and Muhammad Ali. Um, and they wanted portraits that were reminiscent of the original portraits that he took. Here you see um, Jean-Michel Basquiat. He's sitting in a chair uh, holding his cat. Van der Zee photographs, produces, um, oh, I'm sorry, Van der, Van der Zee's photographs that he produces spans many decades and have remained central to the visual narratives about 
Harlem as well as the glamour style and a sense of progress that divined the historical Harlem Renaissance era. Many contemporary artists uh, that dealt with the issues of racism, tokenism, and the black experience draw from Van Der Zee's work. So he really put his own thumbprint on the uh, artistic world with his photography and his unique techniques that he develops. Jean-Michel Basquiat, who you see sitting in front of you, we'll go over his work later, uh, but he is the son of a Haitian immigrant and a Puerto Rican mother, I believe. And they lived in um, Brooklyn, I believe. And Basquiat became a very famous artist in the 90s. Uh, he worked side by side with Andy Warhol and used found objects to create very fascinating paintings that were about his cultural heritage and the world around him. Another famous artist of the Harlem Renaissance is Jacob Lawrence. Um, here you see the Great Migration Series panel number one during World War I. Um, there was a great migration that came, so the Great Migration was a mass migration from the south to the northern parts of the states in the 1930s and 40s. Um, African Americans moved north, hoping that racial tensions would be less pronounced uh, and a hope of a better life. Lawrence was highly influenced by cubism. You can see the flat planes of color and he often uh, worked in woodcuts and um, printmaking. His early works were about African American history. They tended to be small and sometimes had text. He grew up in Harlem during the Depression. Uh, and Harlem was the active cultural center that we just got done talking about. He became interested in art as a teenager and uh, got training at art workshops sponsored by the federal government's Works Project, Works Progress Administration. He goes on to study at the American Artists School in New York. From 38 to 39, he works in the Federal Arts Project and produces some of his earliest major works. He then moves to the MoMA and has an important show that secures his place in the artistic world. Um, Americans tend to adapt the European modernism and tend to bring in more abstracted forms that had been popularized in Europe, especially cubist forms. He tends to have these rhythmic arrangements that have bold, flat colors and shapes, and they speak of racial tensions in the United States. You can see here um, in Jacob Lawrence's print number 49 from the Great Migration series a um, restaurant that is segregated. Uh, the African-Americans sit on the right and the white men sit on the left. You can see the um, gold railing that divides the two sections that sort of undulates back and forth between the center of the canvas. Um, There was lots of hostility between African Americans and whites during this time of the Great Migration. Um, I would say primarily because there was a large influx of migration from the South to the North. Um, and the North really wasn't ready socially um, to be as progressive as they seemed to be. Um, there was more restrictive housing, more restrictive living, um, and restrictive working policies. 
Um, many experts study the Midwest to find strategies of um, exclusion. Migrants were often segregated and segregated into the poor housing conditions. They were forced to take on pay that was inferior um, and they were discriminated against in the workplace. There was widespread unrest uh, over the conditions of their lives and during the summer of 1919, race riots ensue. Uh, okay, I told you that. All right, so let's move on to Jacob Lawrence's The Shoemaker. Um, Lawrence tends to sort of have this fine line between abstract and figurative art. Uh, he uses aesthetic values for social ends um, and he's successful at balancing and sort of, oh, tension aspects, racial tensions in his art and aspects of it in his art. Um, he really has a body of work that is a wonderful testament to history. He captures the history of the Great Migration. He captures the history of the poor working conditions. He captures the history of racism in his works of art. Um, he has a long and distinguished career. He's one of the first American artists that was trained in Harlem. And he was definitely influenced by Jacob Lawrence. Oh, I'm sorry. He was definitely influenced by Aaron Douglas. Um, and so you can see cubism tendencies in his works of art. Harlem was where he gains recognition for his art in the beginning but as he produces more and more art he is sort of tapping into this mainstream of modern art and so um he becomes big in not only the black community but also in the overall art community uh, and New York really propels his career. 